we're talking about how we just don't trust you. Can engineers change credit ratings? A little bit about our background. Um, Toby's been written, writing books for a while on uh, collective intelligence and semantic data, and currently works for Freebase, it, working on these ideas. And I currently work on data mining and credit fraud for a company called Open Data Group. And uh, this is a talk about what we think is one of the biggest structural problems that we face um, in this country and all around the world, um, and sort of a half-formed idea about how to solve it. September 14th, 2008, um, Moody's, the bond rating agency, has a rating for Lehman Brothers of A2. That's the second highest rating that you can get. The next day, September 15th, after Lehman files for bankruptcy, Moody's wakes up and decides to downgrade Lehman's credit debt to un uninvestable triple C rating. Investors get no warning about the oncoming default from Moody's. November 27th, uh, 2001, Enron is rated BAA3, which is lower than investment grade, but this is already after the SEC has begun investigating them for fraud and uh, the stock is already tanked. Enron is finally downgraded on December 4th, killing its white knight in, uh, merger with Dynergy that would have saved the company. Later on, we learned that this was the most massive accounting fraud in history, possibly only followed by Iceland later on. So perhaps you're starting to see a pattern. September 14th, 2008, AIG holds the highest possible credit rating that you can get from Moody's. September 15th, Moody's downgrades AIG's credit, forcing them to put up collateral for the debts that they have. Subsequently, Moody's holds further talks between the Treasury and AIG hostage, forcing them to add certain requirements to the financing deals to maintain their credit rating, or they would have to put up more collateral, putting AIG into bankruptcy in February. So here's a quote from 1996. We've been knowing this problem for a while. This is Thomas Friedman. There are two superpowers in the world. There's the United States and there's Moody's credit rating, and we don't know which one's more powerful. That's, that was true then, it's true now, and it's only gotten worse as we move to more securitized debt and we become more dependent upon easy credit to make our financial system work. This, these, uh, these changes are the ones that, that, that grew the, the uh, economics and created the credit bubble that ultimately led to our mortgage asset bubble and the current recession that we're in. Now we've made many regulations to protect ourselves and had a lot of advances in technology. We have some standards. There's the Basel I Accords that were passed in 1998 in response to the, the stock market crash and the Basel II Accords that were ratified in 2004 and haven't been adopted by most nations yet. The organizations that are chartered by these accords are regulated by the SEC and are called nationally recognized statistical rating organizations. Because of the Enron scandal in 2006, every one of these organizations was forced to get themselves recertified in the United States. Not a single one of them failed to pass. We now still have the same 10 uh, credit rating agencies that we had before because the standards weren't raised at all for certification. So why are we so concerned about this? Why is Thomas Friedman talking in 1996 about how powerful Moody's is and why it's something that we should pay attention to? The reason is our economy is fueled by debt. It's the cheapest way to raise capital to, to accomplish something. If you want to buy a home, if you want to go to school, if you want to build a factory for your company. Both personal and commercial debt have increased multiple times over the last three decades, and Moody has been the gatekeeper in determining who's allowed to issue debt and what rates those debts have to be paid for in terms of the risk. So if you're a mutual fund or a government pension fund, you actually have a lot of requirements about what you can invest in, and you can only invest in the highest, most le least risky bonds out there. Well, Moody's is the only organization you can go to to get that certification. And on the other hand, if you're a company that needs to issue debt to accomplish a goal to build a factory, you can also only really go to one of three credit rating agencies to get that debt rated, and you're beholden to the criteria that they set forth for the debt transaction to go forward. Now, this shouldn't be really so complicated. Credit risk is the oldest form of risk we really knew how to do. It's just a measure of how well do people trust each other? Do I believe that you're going to honor your obligation to me? We've been doing this since Shylock. The problem is that people generally are pretty good fulfilling their obligations. We are good people as a whole. So we don't have a lot of examples of bankruptcy and failures to fulfill our obligations. 
And this has sort of made us complacent, that we don't see that many failures. We believe that, that the system is friction-free, and we ignore the structural issues that actually cause a lot of friction and create a lot of danger within the system. And the structural issues are really important. This isn't a, a situation, I think, where a lot of people right now are getting really angry at a lot of people. There's a lot of moral outrage, and that is really justified. You have a right to be mad at the people who created this problem. But the problems are also structural, and people are just reacting to very strong market forces to create some of the mistakes that we've had. Um, in particular, we've created a system that really promotes gaming in, by creating an oligopoly of, of regulated companies that can compete against each other only really for uh, quality of ratings. So we're going to show you what we think are the four top strongest, uh, four most important structural problems facing the credit industry and what we can do about them and try to fix them. So here's what I was referring to before. Um, a, a situation where gaming is, is what the market wants. If you have three large credit raters, Moody's, Fitch, and S&P, and you have a, a bucket of mortgages you want to sell in a bond, you're going to go to one of the three of them to get your credit rating. You're going to pay roughly the same amount to each one of them. They need your fee to stay in business. And the only way they can compete is by giving you a better product. Well, the only product they have is a better rating. So they're going to bid up the rating until one of them exceeds what the other ones are willing to tolerate in terms of risk. And if you can get a triple A for the same price as you can get a double B rating, you're going to pick the triple A rating. And so these rating agencies are heavily incentivized to give erroneous and, and under risk out assessing scores for their bonds. And this looks a lot like bribery, right? It, it, this is something where you, you think this should be illegal, and it's not. It's just the market forces. It's just pricing in a different way, where people are trying to compete on the best product available for their customer. And, and they're not committing a crime, but this is a structural issue in the system. And this is the, the first thing that we want you to remember, is that payments create bad ratings. This is not something where you want people incentivized to manipulate the actual product that they're creating in order to get more fees and become a more successful company. So here's something Jesper mentioned earlier. Um, the rating agencies, there's three of them, so they don't really have a monopoly. There's three big ones. So um, it's actually an oligopoly. Uh, what that means is that any government pension fund, like uh, the California Pension Fund, which is currently losing a, a ton of money, and it's the country's biggest investment fund, is required by law to use the ratings that these, um, that these, companies, that these companies put out. So, um, even if, and even if you don't have a public pension, it's very likely that your 401k has a fund in it that has covenants that says they have to use, they can only invest in things that are rated A by Moody's or S&P. So, even aside from the payment problem that Jesper just covered, we can, we'll, we're, we'll see that this is, an, this is a huge problem. So, rating agencies have no legal obligation to describe their methods. Um, in the United States, we have a patent system. The patent system, we've all spent many, many years learning about how terrible patents are um, from Cory Doctorow and people like that. But the patent system actually does have one good feature, which is that when you, protect, when you have an invention protected, you also have to disclose exactly how it works. The risk rating system takes the worst of both worlds. Not only are they protected, they don't even have to say what they're doing. Um, and, because, and also, because they have this monopoly, they have no incentive to say what they're doing. They can't compete and say, oh, well, our method is better. You should trust our ratings more. Uh, all they want is for you to just trust their ratings, and you're stuck, with, you're stuck with being told, this is AAA. You should buy it. And to make matters even worse, AAA doesn't actually even mean anything. All it tells us is this, this is the highest rating you can get. Um, it doesn't tell you the chance of default. You can't figure out if one AAA bond is better than another one. And even worse than that, it doesn't describe the exact risk factors involved. Now, um, I work in technology. If I'm going to invest in my safe investment, what I really want is something that's completely uncorrelated with technology. Um, I should be buying timber bonds or something like that. And um, also, if I'm buying multiple sets of bonds, what I really don't want is to buy two different things that are completely that are going to completely crash if the price of oil drops. So um, obscuring the risk rating means that we can't even build, we can't even diversify or decide what risks we're exposed to. Um, 
So, yeah, so because all I have is this AAA proclamation, I have no idea what risks a company is exposed to, what might make it go bankrupt. And there's almost nothing to say about this, but um, I'll try. The day Lehman Brothers declared bankruptcy, after, after it declared bankruptcy, then Moody's decided to, um, to downgrade its debt to, um, I, I don't know what downgraded it to, triple C. Um, this is not a way to build an investment thesis. This is not a way to guarantee safe investments for pensions and retirement funds by telling people you can buy bonds that these people say are okay till they say they're not okay after the company is bankrupt. So the second structural problem is that there's no transparency. That um, I'm not allowed to, I'm not allowed to, to know what the method is, I just have to trust you. The only acceptable solution to this is for full disclosure of how, the, how companies come to the, get the ratings that they have. So some of you may have noticed in the cover of this month's Wired magazine, there's a big formula on the cover, and that's the cover story, is on the Gaussian cupola function. And that was a method for evaluating risk of buckets of, of bonds. And that really, it was a really simple equation that came up with a really simple, easily to interpret results, and that took the industry by storm. And it, after its invention, over five years, everyone was using it. There was literally no one who was really talking about any other way to approach risk calculation. And so you got a situation where it's very easy for everyone. You could talk back and forth and just share simple parameters for this function, and everyone understood what you were talking about. But you were embracing a lot of risk because you were that tension of ideas fighting in the marketplace. And, and to, we had this a period of groupthink and amazing consensus where the industry didn't feel the need for options because the, the friction was just so high in communicating. Why would you bother to learn a new model? Because the guy you're trying to teach about that model doesn't want to understand it, can't understand it, won't go through the trouble to learn about a different way of thinking about risk. And so we've undergone a period where we've had sort of a lot of innovation, but we've not innovated at all in this space because it just wasn't any forces driving us towards inventing a new way of measuring risk. And this is something we understand in risk assessment. It's called model risk. And it's essentially the, the, the risk that the guy you hired to think about and measure risk isn't as smart or isn't as good as you thought he was and has made a mistake. And the only real way to account for that is to have multiple models in competition in the environment. But to do that, you actually have to have developed those uh, models and have a way of measuring which one can replace the other and which one's doing better and what are the metrics by which you evaluate that. Uh, this happens, you, you can understand the tendency towards this sort of groupthink in a single company, but, and that's okay. You can have people devote around a single philosophy, but if you have an entire industry, that has certain models as their core tenets, that's not really a, a model issue, that's just dogma, and that, that's something that really should be resisted. And when you have a, a situation like dogma, you have another market effect that's really dangerous, which is that everything's priced the same way. And if you have a system where your mutual fund isn't able to invest in anything that's not rated AAA, then it can only invest in things that are are that safe. There are a lot of people in that same position, so those bonds are too expensive relative to the rest of the market. These mutual funds would really like to invest in something rated non-AAA, but they can't because everyone agrees on every rating for every bond. But if you have a system where someone just makes a small mistake in what the bond actually is, mislabels a dangerous bond as a safe bond, but it's priced as the unsafe bond, Everyone's going to want to buy that. This is a really cheap bargain that you are legally and structurally allowed to purchase. And you not only want to, you have to buy that because everyone else, all of your competitors, are now buying this same asset too. This creates a phenomenon where they'll bid up the value. More people will produce these sorts of bonds, and eventually you have a bubble. And this is exactly what creates an asset bubble and is what happened with the mortgage-backed securities that we're dealing with now. This is our next finding, which is basically lack of ecosystems create bad ratings. We want a competitive marketplace where ideas are bounced back and forth, and we're not just working on a fee-based structure where people are competing on manipulating the results. So as we said before, uh, the, rating, the rating agencies in their efforts to be as opaque as possible don't tell you about what risks they're considering. Um, of course, as a responsible investor, maybe you want to research some of the risks on your own, so you go through some filings, you uh, try to follow the paper trail, maybe find out about a class action lawsuit that's been built up, but chances are you'll miss something. 
Um, and I would say, obviously, this time everyone, everyone missed something. Um, and so this brings us to our fourth problem. Some risks, okay, here's a phrase you're, sick of, you're getting sick of hearing. Some, uh, this is a black swan for those who pay no attention to financial commentary. Um, it's, used to, it's used to metaphorically represent uh, a risk that you couldn't possibly have known about no matter what. Um, and uh, this does happen sometimes. Sometimes lightning strikes a factory and it burns to the ground and you lose your investment. However, uh, I think that black swans we use to cover up a lot of mistakes, saying that we couldn't possibly have known about it. Um, we can do better than that. So as early as 2005, this guy, uh, Noriel Rubini, uh, wrote that we were, prices were riding a speculative wave that would soon sink the economy. Back then, he was called a Cassandra. Now he's called a sage. The point of this is not to pile more praise on Rubini, because um, he's gotten plenty of that recently. Uh, the point is that there were people out there who were, who, were, who were noticing the problems, and they were completely ignored. Uh, anyone know who this is? This is Bethany McLean. Um, she was the first public figure to look into Enron's, uh, Enron's finances, offshore holdings, stuff like that. She was writing, and she wrote in Newsweek for six months, six months before anyone at the rating agencies took notice. Uh, in that time, the market reacted much more quickly um, by, by forcing down the price of Enron shares. Uh, but all the funds could still, hold, could still hold Enron's debt. Shouldn't we be incorporating the knowledge as it happens? She was writing about this, and no one had any incentive to pay attention to her. Oops, sorry. And finally, even if you're, not, if you're not a public intellectual and you're not a reporter, then maybe, and, and yet you figure out that there's a problem with the rating of, of debt, then maybe you, have, maybe you don't have an incentive to tell anyone. This guy's John Paulson. Um, I don't know, you might have read an article about him in Portfolio by Michael Lewis. Um, he made the single biggest hedge fund return. It's the biggest single year hedge fund return ever in 2007 because he figured out that the ratings on credit default swaps were wrong. Now he actually, to his credit, tried to tell people a few times and no one would listen. So instead he just started shorting them. Um, and yeah, he made the biggest hedge fund return ever. So our fourth and final reason that we're gonna describe here that ratings are bad is because the information used to create them is not diverse enough. Sources of information are unexpected. You never know where like the key insight that will tell you the huge risk that a company is exposed to is gonna come from. So the only solution we see to this is to allow information to come from many different sources. Okay, so it's completely broken and we don't have a credit system that functions. And this inevitably is gonna to lead to breakdowns in our financial system. Uh, that doesn't mean that we can just complain about it and, and cry over spilled milk. We can't function without a system like this. This is something that has to work right. Uh, so the only real question we have is, is what are we gonna do about it? Because this is a huge, huge problem. This is a $45 trillion market that we're not regulating correctly. To give you a sense of that, that's 280 times more than the value of all of internet search. That's the $25 trillion mortgage-backed security market for our homes is twice our GDP. And this is 37 times the size of anyone's projected market size for clean technology through the next 15 years. This is a really big deal that has to be solved now. And there are a lot of problems. There, there are a lot of dangerous problems, a lot of really big problems. These are scary things that ought to be intimidating. We, got, we have payments are a problem. Consensus is a problem in our system. Data sources or lack of multiple data sources is a problem and opacity on, into the way the system works is a huge problem. But the lucky thing is engineers don't have problems, we have requirements. And once you know that, you can go ahead and just try to solve the problem from that. And what are our requirements? We have our pointy-haired boss telling us rating creation needs to be accessible. The ratings need to be open. Uh, they need to support diversity and they need to be transparent. And these are requirements we can work with. These are, there are a lot of ideas for how to handle them, a lot of ideas that first came up at com this conference in previous iterations. And we know how to implement them from those examples. 
So first of all, we can take the finding that ratings should be a commons. Information rating agencies are producing, the information rating agencies are producing is way more valuable to society, society as a whole than any one of the individual actors within the system. They're not gonna price it correctly because they all have contradictory motives and we as a society have better motives. You can't compensate society for the, the, the cost of this privatization. And this is why commons exist, to regulate these things that are too big. Fundamentally, we really believe that risk management is way too important just for society to be a competitive advantage for any one firm. And that will, for a lot of people, bring up the wrong idea. Right? This is not dig. We're not talking about voting up or voting down which bond is the best or the worst. That's pretty much how the equities market works. It works great there, but, but debt is different for a reason. Debt is about trust and about knowing things. It's just, um, we don't think that that kind of crowdsourced voting is the right model. And it's certainly not discussion boards, right? And Yahoo Finance message boards are just about as bad as YouTube message boards. They don't provide any value. And more importantly, risk assessment is a, it's a technical field. There are a lot of approaches, and you can be really opinionated about your approach to risk management, but it's not a place for opinions to actually play a role. It needs to be dispassionate and be, be relatively cold and detached from any subjective concerns of the system, or it won't be trusted. The whole point is that we need a system that has no outside agency issues. So a while ago, Tim O'Reilly told us to work on things that matter. And we think that right now, saving the world's financial system probably matters most of all. Um, so we're proposing a simple idea that we hope can be part of a bigger solution. And we started building a simple platform that um, combines authoritative data, user-contributed data, contributive al algorithms, and a testing framework. Um, although we'll be showing a couple of screenshots, I want to emphasize that this is very much a prototype work in progress. Um, but it, it hopefully is enough to show you that uh, we're really trying to build something and we're not just here to get angry. <laughs> so uh, open data has been one of my personal themes for a while now. Um, to me, it means both consuming the data that's made available to us on the web and publishing it so it's easy for others to use. The first step to free risk was getting authoritative financial data. So we looked at what the government is currently providing. Now, this, is a, um, this is a page from the SEC website. Um, all, all public companies have to file with the SEC things like uh, their annual statements, their um, special events, and um, insider trades, things like that. Um, and as of today, these are mostly difficult to pass text files. Uh, they, um, there are companies like Capital IQ that make their entire business out of passing these files. Um, but the SEC is, is actually mandating a switch to a format called XBRL, which um, they're moving all, all large companies to it in 2009 and all public companies by 2011. And um, it's a machine readable format. And this is actually an RSS feed of all the filings that are coming through on XBRL right now. So you can see that a lot of big companies are already doing it. Uh, unfortunately, th this is an XBRL file f filing for 3M. Um, 3M makes scotch tape, among other things. Uh, this is um, over 1,000 lines long. And um, a whole cottage industry has now sprung up to, uh, to deal with XBRL files uh, be to, to make sure that companies can meet the SEC requirements. Unfortunately, and further, XBRL isn't just long. It's also extremely complicated. Um, if just take a look at these numbers, there's 35,000 defined elements, 43 taxonomies. And uh, this, won't work for, this just won't work for creating the next generation of financial hackers because the effort of tracking down a taxonomy and trying to figure out how it matches another taxonomy, it'll really make you cry, which I know from experience. And, um, but we're going we're gonna to do that for you anyway. So we started simplifying. Um, we took a semantic data store and started filling it with the basics, like things that appear on an income statement, revenue, assets, liabilities. Um, and, and, made, and turn it into an easier to follow graph structure. And because it's a semantic store, it'll easily accommodate new kinds of data as we decide that they're gonna be important for risk grading. And also, it will, um, it will, one important thing that I'll get to soon is that it has the flexibility for custom user annotations on things that they find buried in the footnotes. So um, here's a screenshot of, of a portion of it. Uh, we tried to use standards wherever possible. The data is stored in RDF. Um, we used generally accepted accounting, um, accounting principles, which is GAAP, 
namespace wherever we could for, um, for, with the, for accounting terms, and we used uh, Freebase namespace for companies and organizations. So this means the data can be queried with Sparkle, even as it gets more complicated. Um, and so here you see a query for companies with a low current ratio. That's a ratio of, li of current liabilities to current assets, of current assets to current liabilities. And um, you can see that it's, you can type a query and query for anything across the whole data set. Uh, we also tried to create simpler ways for, develop, for developers to access the data. Uh, here's a JSON result for the 3M data um, through, through an API that we've provided. Uh, you can see that we're still using the gap namespaces, but now it's just um, for, for a certain statement period, we have the, gap, we have the uh, accounting term and then the number. It's so much easier to read and so much, familiar, so much more familiar to regular developers. And uh, we're working on viewers to make it easier to look at statements. Um, I don't know how clear this is, actually. But uh, the important thing to this is actually the, um, is at the bottom there, um, there's a footnote. This is a statement from Microsoft, and there's a footnote there that says that um, part of their, um, part of the, the net income actually includes $1.4 billion fine to the, um, to the European Commission. Um, and that doesn't come up in the XBRL itself. So you need someone to go through and read these things and figure out what they mean. And this is what, what we mean when we talk about getting more different sources of data, is that there is a lot of great stuff in the filings which doesn't appear in the official numbers. And so uh, you can see that a user, Toby, has actually added that this is, um, I've created a couple of new predicates, uh, which is the, this, this is a fine by the European Commission and the fine amount. And so someone who comes along later can, can, will be able to get that as a JSON result or in the calculators you'll see in a minute. So a lot of people we talked to about this idea are really in, interested in the fact that we're a hub and, and want to understand what our role as gatekeeper would be between all these, these parties. And we really don't want that role. I think people who are really interested in that are missing the point of what we're trying to say about openness and diversity of opinion in, in creating risk analytics. And the, the way around that is really to have open APIs and to let anyone do anything they want with our system. Uh, and we really work very hard to make our APIs require minimal effort and unfettered access to all the data, both for integrating with our system and publishing your own metrics, as well as just pulling down the data and, and doing what you want with it. This is you know, financial data that is publicly available. You should be able to see it in whatever format you want to simply and easily. And so the first thing that we have is it's, it's very easy to make a risk calculator. It's two URL in, uh, endpoints. Give us a query that, we want, that you want us to pull for Sparkle based on the company name and the period you want that data from. And then we'll go ahead and post back a JSON string with that data to your calculator. You give us back a score. It's a pretty easy round trip, something most people can do. There's not a lot of engineering overhead to get this done. On the other hand, if you want to go and see anyone else's results and see what people are doing in the risk world, you don't have, we don't have to know about a risk calculator. If you just know the URI of someone's calculator, you can go ahead and, and check out their scores, either on a single basis give us their target URL, the company in a period, or just give us the URL in a period, and we'll give you a ranking of every score for every company that we know about based on that calculating approach, which we think is pretty fair. Uh, we have a couple of examples. So if you really don't know how to write a web server at all, you can just go ahead and download our Ruby on Rails examples or our Python examples. You just implement the bodies of two methods with your calculation, cross over a couple of dictionaries, and you get the data out and return our results, trying to keep this as lightweight as possible, really foster as much innovation as we possibly can within this space. And finally, if you restrict yourself to a couple of features, we're going to go ahead and tell you how good your rating is. So if your score is monotonic, if it goes up as things get safer, and if, in fact, goes up and not down as, as things get better, then we'll go ahead and we'll give you a covariance of your score to actual default rates, and we'll let you compete in the marketplace of the scores, let everyone know who's doing the best job of measuring risk right now and who's optimizing and learning more about the, the marketplace as they refine their systems. And we think this would be a lot like the Netflix leaderboard, where people are competing in a marketplace of semi-private ideas and a lot of open discussion around how to analyze that data set. This is a, just another data set that we feel is more important, that people can, can aggressively compete in the same way. Uh, just to show that there are already a couple of solutions out there in public. Uh, this is the Piotrowski score. This is 
dead simple. You don't even need to know math to know how to do this score. It's a series of if statements where you do ratios and see what has changed and you add a point. The score is between one and nine. It works incredibly well. Add no calculus, none of that fancy Gaussian, cupola, anything. Just look at a balance statement, look at an income statement, and you can get this done. If you come from a machine learning background, this one will probably be a little more familiar. This is an Altman z-score. It's based on discriminant analysis. And it's just common metrics that most financial people will use. You could talk to any accountant. You would learn about these in five minutes, weighted in different proportions relative to the probability of this firm's chance of success. Uh, this is from 1968. This is a really old equation that sort of got forgotten about and has actually done in our models incredibly well at predicting outcomes. We have a couple examples here. This is a time series of Lehman Brothers, the year before its default and going bankrupt. And the blue line represents Lehman's actual credit rating by this algorithm. The red line is anything below that, don't invest in it ever. The green line is safe to invest in, right? And the regime in the middle are risky things that you might want to consider. Lehman was dead on arrival by this algorithm for a long, long time. Yeah, its score was actually below zero, which we didn't realize was possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And here's AIG. It's slightly better. It's above zero. It's like at 0.3 on average. But it's still like, this is not an investable company. If you had this algorithm or using this credit score, you would not be in this market with them right now. And just to show that we're not gaming the system, this uh, equation actually does predict good companies. Here's Microsoft at about five. It's well in the investable region. They're going down right now. If you have Microsoft stock, look at their balance sheet. They're going through a lot of cash, which is why the score dropped. Uh, but you can generally get a sense that this, their debt is safe right now. And, and I think everyone here would feel that that at least resonates with what our general sense is. The horizontal axis? Time. Yeah, what time frame are we looking at? Those are quarters. It's over the year. This is all, all over the year before Lehman went under. OK, so um, there's a reason we presented this today. Uh, right now, we have a lot of anger, a simple idea, and the beginnings of a prototype. Um, but we need help. <laughs> uh, we need to grow the community. We need data contributors. Uh, we need calculators. We hope that we've made a compelling case that A, this is very, very important, and B, that we're serious about it. We're really trying to do something about it, even if it's a simple start. Um, the biggest hurdle right now that we're facing is data completeness. Uh, the more data we can collect, the more compelling the project is. Even beyond its use for credit ratings, just making financial data accessible to, to, to anyone, I think, is a, is a worthwhile goal. Um, and we'd like to eventually support data from many sources, both uh, XBRL, non-XBRL, and from within the US and outside the US. Um, and we've shown that even a simple calculation, that something that you can implement in a few lines in pylons or rails, um, can be competitive with the official guys, very, very competitive. Um, and we've also shown that there are many people out there who saw the risks and publicized them long before anyone else, long before they were officially recognized. So we think there's something here, and we really think it's worth a shot. One problem is that it's um, very hard for a new rating its agent to start, agency to start, and this is one reason why we're stuck in this situation. It's a chicken and egg problem. You can't make any money until you get recognized. And it's impossible to last long enough to, to get recognized if you don't have money. Um, but this is why we actually think that an open community-based system could help solve this problem, because it doesn't need cash to operate. It just needs people who are, who are passionate about it. And uh, I just wanted to show this really quick. Um, ever since the abstract went up on the eTech website, we've been getting interest from all kinds of people. Um, just emailing us. And it's really great to recognize that there is passion about this subject and that people really, really want to do something about it and that there could definitely be a community here. Um, we're, we're really happy to know that we're not completely alone and crazy and thinking that this is something that needs to be solved. And this is a quote from, from a senior researcher at IBM who emailed us. We've also had VCs interested in whether this is investable. Um, all kinds of things like that, but, um, but we're just excited that there's passion around this subject. And thank you. What's your site?
<laughs> uh, you can go to, you can go to freerisk.org. There's not much up there yet, but we're putting up more soon. So everything everything we showed you is available on freerisk.org right now. Oh, I don't think there's a link oh. to the main page for the statements. Oh, <laughs> it will be tonight. 